You know, I thought it interesting, and Carol was talking about the big rocket this morning. And then Chris got up here and said, and we just had a blast. Of course, that was no pun intended, was it, Chris? <laughs> anyway, we're glad the children had a wonderful time, and uh, hopefully they were uplifted to see the Lord Amen. Jesus Christ and realize who, who loves them the most. Amen? Uh, real quickly, just to let you know, we had shared with you before that we had ordered 40,000 hardback illustrated great controversies. Uh, nothing usually ends up when you expect them. It's always a little bit later. And so this is the same thing. We'll have them done by the second week of July. So keep praying about that because all the legislators, state legislators across the United States will receive one of these books by the grace of God. And uh, they need to understand these truths for these times as well. What do you say? And then uh, all after that, of course, we'll be sending them out. And it's a good thing it's delayed a little bit because most of the legislators are not back into session until August anyway. So it'll work out pretty well. And then we'll also be sending uh, 30 some thousand to go to uh, the Sunday keeping pastors and Catholic priests across the, across the nation as well. We've got to get the gospel out there. The everlasting gospel has to go. People have to be awakened. We're told many of these people will join with God's remnant people here at the end. Amen. So we must share the truth with them as well to every kindred, tongue, nation, people. Before we begin the message this morning, preach Jesus, if you would bow your heads with me, seek the Lord once more in prayer. Our Father, our God, we thank you again for the privilege and opportunity of being here in your house of prayer, house of worship. Because you've told us where two or three are gathered together, you will be in our midst. We claim that promise today. And may we show reverence because Jesus is in his house of prayer. So we thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory and thanksgiving. Guard my words, my thoughts, my actions. May they be pleasing in thy sight. For your glory we pray these things in his holy and glorious name. Amen. Amen. Preach Jesus. Preach Jesus. <laughs> I know sometimes uh, people don't like to hear present truth or the straight truth or present truth. You've heard that, right? And it's no different now than it was back in uh, Paul's day. As a matter of fact, if you go to uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Paul penned this particular letter to Timothy in AD 66, in verse, uh, uh, verse, or chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead as appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. What that means is you preach the word whether people want to hear it or they don't want to hear it. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to preach the Word. We're to give the everlasting gospel. And uh, it says, preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove. We hate that word. Rebuke. We hate that word. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but a heap unto themselves of their own lusts and heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. So we're told here at the end, people won't want to hear the truth. And I remember Tom um, you know, uh, Timothy was like a son to Paul. It wasn't blood, but it was like a son. And Tom, sitting back there, we're not, we're not blood in the sense we have the same fathers and mothers, but we're, he's like my son. And I remember him sharing a story how he was doing some work at a church, Sunday keeping church, here a while back. And he was replacing a floor that had gotten wet and was all warped and whatever. And he was replacing this floor. And uh, so he was there several days, and the pastor would come in and check and see how things were going. And he said to him, he said, he said, uh, he said Tom, why don't you and your family come over and, and join us on Sunday mornings for church service? And Tom's response was, well, pastor, if you're keeping the true Sabbath, I might just do that. Amen. Because Saturday is a Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Pastor evidently got a little bit nervous about that, and the response was, I do believe that Saturday is the seventh day Sabbath, but if I preach that to my congregation, I'll be out of job. You know, there's many out there like that that know the truth and know the word, but they're afraid to preach it because they would lose their salaries or lose their jobs because Paul said, The time's coming they will not endure sound doctrine. But you know what? As uh, Martin Luther 
in, his, in the chapters in the Great Controversy, page 165, Martin Luther says, you can't preach Jesus Christ without offense. Amen. Hello? You cannot preach Jesus Christ without offense. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, he was despised, and he is despised. Amen. We're seeing it more and more today in our lifetime, aren't we? Amen. I remember years ago, I don't know if how many remember Joe Cruz. Joe Cruz was a powerful preacher. He was the one that started, he and the conference president in Chesapeake started Amazing Facts. And you know, there were a lot of conferences in North American division that would not allow him to come and preach at their conferences. Joe used to tell it like it was. Remember, I don't know how many of you remember, but he did a book entitled uh, The Creeping Compromise. Man, there were some folks wanting to run him out of the church for that. And all he was sharing was what the Word of God says and what was coming from his heart. We've had recently, we've had some situations here in this conference where there were certain people that the church was told not to allow to come in to preach. But the church, good on them, the church met, had a meeting, prayed it through, studied what this man was preaching and teaching, and they decided to have him come anyway. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Need to stand for the truth. So when you preach about sin or you preach about uh, righteousness and judgment, uh, pe sometimes people tell you and share with you, it says, why do you have to preach those doctrines all the time? Why don't you preach Jesus? You're told. Well, friends, Jesus is the doctrines. How do you preach the state of the dead without having the author of life who is the everlasting life? How do you preach the Sabbath and let you preach the Lord of the Sabbath? Amen. How do you preach the sanctuary without preaching about the high priest yes. and who's interceding for us today? But basically what people are saying most of the time is they're saying things like they want you to preach for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But there's, in that text of what Jesus said, for those that believe, James chapter 2 verse 19 says, the devils believe and tremble. Are they going to have eternal life? No. But there are so many comforting things. I go to John chapter 14. This one, certain we love. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it are not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Praise God Amen. for those comforting words. Amen. And he also says in verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Praise God. Amen. But Jesus also said in John chapter 15, He says, uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. And without me you can do absolutely nothing. Nothing. Not a single thing. You can't take your next breath. Your heart will not beat another time without God providing that power to each one of us. In John chapter 16, verse 7 and 8. You might want to write these down. We're going to move pretty quickly. John chapter 16, verse 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for me that I go away. And if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he cometh, he shall reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Matter of fact, the first angel says, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his His hour of His judgment is come. There's no limit to the promises of God. Would you agree with that? Amen. There's so many beautiful promises of God. However, 
The promises and threatenings of God are conditional. You believe that? Yes. Case in point, Nineveh. Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And of course you know the story how he ran away and tried to hide from the Lord. He kept going down, 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 down until he got, ended up in a fish's belly. I'm sure that was pleasant. But uh, he went, finally he went into Nineveh and he gave the message. In 40 days, if you have not repented in 40 days, this city will be overthrown. This city will be destroyed. Is that a condition? Praise God, the king uh, took off his kingly robes and put on sackcloth and ashes, and the whole city repented. And the whole city fasted and prayed. And God did not destroy Nineveh at that time. Praise the name. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, we read, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Is there a condition? If we confess, there's a condition there. Also, in Matthew chapter 6, if you go there, Matthew chapter 6, because we're going to go to the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to preach Jesus, and the Sermon on the Mount, what better place to find where Jesus was preaching? Matthew chapter 6, in verse 12, and Jesus said, dealing, this is the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Then if you look at verse 14 and 15, and if we, if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if, here's the condition, but if ye forgive not men their trespasses, your sins will not be forgiven. Is that, is that pretty clear, isn't it? I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. Even dummies like me can understand that. If you don't forgive your neighbor, God cannot forgive you. How many in the church, say around North American Division today, that have animosities towards one of the other members or maybe their neighbor? Can we be forgiven? Jesus said, unless you forgive... Sometimes you say, oh, well, I, 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 forg I forgave him. Well, not if you keep clinging to it. Amen. You know, we sing the song all the time. We've sing the song, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that's going to be. But I'm here to share with you, friends, if we, if we can't get along with our neighbor here, we're not going to have a mansion next to somebody and we're going to put a, not a see-through fence along or a no, no trespassing sign. We're not going to be taking them to court. We need to follow God's way and will today. And the only way we can do that is full surrender. Because self wants to always rise up. Always wants to rise up. Well, if you're there in the Sermon on the Mount, that's the best place I know to start with. If you're going to preach Jesus, let's look at what Jesus had to say in the Sermon on the Mount, and you look at verse 8, and it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So what if we're not pure in heart? Will we see God? Is there a condition here? Let the pure in heart, and they shall see God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. What is that savor? That salt, what is that? What did they use salt for back in those days? A preservative. People, many people do it today. Matter of fact, I got a little building out there by the house, and they used to... Uh, hang there after they uh, killed the pigs and they'd hang them up in there and they'd salt them down and let them cure out and dry out. And now I got deer coming up in the back of the building trying to dig all the rocks out and guess what they're looking for? 
salt. Amen. We can't lose our Savior. We, we, uh, we have to uh, be that preservative to help others to find Jesus and to be preserved for His second coming. Because uh, it says, and this is a little Bible commentary, if we profess Christians love Jesus better than the world, we will love to speak of Him. If we love Jesus better than the world, we'll love to speak of Him. We will speak what we love. Would you agree? Amen. If we love our brand new car, we're going to tell everybody about it, how nice that thing works. Just cruises right along. Matter of fact, I just hit the switches and I just sat back and let it drive itself. We tell people about those things. We tell people about our favorite movies. We tell people about our favorite sports uh, programs or whatever. But if we love Jesus better than the world, we will love to tell of Him. Amen. Jesus said in chapter 5, verse 15, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus preaching, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. Verse 14, Ye are the light of the world. It doesn't say try to light. It says ye are the light. And we need to reflect that everywhere we go. What do you say? We, we were, uh, took Christy, we had to go in the hos uh, to the hospital, take her to the hospital, uh, <coughs> see the doctor there in Charlottesville. So we stopped to have lunch. And we stopped to have lunch, and as our custom, as we usually do before we eat, we had a word of prayer and asked the Lord to bless the food. Amen. He provided. And the waitress came over and was, I am so thankful to see someone thanking their Lord for their food. It was like it was a shock to her system. And I'm sure there are many, 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 many Christians that go in there to eat. Shouldn't have been a shock to her system, should it? They don't need to look around and see if anybody's looking. We don't need to be ashamed. Amen. Father, thank you for providing this food. You've been so gracious to us. Who knows, your light shining there might inspire someone else to do the same thing. Amen? And look to Jesus more fully. But it says, you are the light of the world. Don't hide it under a bushel. <clears throat> Don't hide it under a bushel. And Jesus also said, preaching Jesus, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. We don't want to deny Him. He didn't deny us. We certainly shouldn't be denying Him. Back to Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 50. Or 5, verse, verse uh, 20, it says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, one of the signs of the last days, it says they have, uh, what does it say? They, uh, they don't have the power thereof from such turn away. That's what it tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So Jesus is saying, unless your righteousness exceeds that of, the, of uh, these church leaders or people that are talking all about the Lord, we, our righteousness needs to exceed that. Can it exceed that by the grace and power of God? Can it? We don't want to be like the ten spies that came back and said, there's giants in the land, we can't go. Only Joshua and Caleb said we can. You know, I, I was just reading, Pat and I were just reading that, and uh, Christy, I think, was reading it with us. Just recently, uh, the spies came back and convinced the people, no, you can't go in, you can't go in, you can't go in. God said, I've promised it to you. I'll deliver it to you. I'll defeat the foes for you. But they wouldn't go, they wouldn't go, and they wanted the stone, Caleb and Joshua, because they were given the straight message, yes, we can, God's promised it to us, and they wanted to stone them to death. But you know, it's interesting, Jesus said, for every day you're up there spying, you're going you're to spend 40 years in the wilderness, wandering around the wilderness. When they could have gotten in the promised land, it was 11 days' march from Egypt to the Jordan River. 
11 days. And yet they were there 40 years. Then after they were told that they were spend 40 years, all of a sudden the same people that objected to going in, guess what they wanted to do? They wanted to go in and conquer. When God told them to do something, they wouldn't. When God said, don't do it, they did. Sounds familiar to some of us, doesn't it? You know, the, the, the biggest fear I have among any people on planet Earth is me. I don't trust me. Me will let you down. God will never let us down. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, still on the Sermon on the Mount, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time that thou shalt not kill, but whosoever shall kill shall be, be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, thou shalt be in danger of hellfire. So we don't necessarily have to actually literal murder someone, but if in our hearts we hate that person, Jesus is saying, it's about the same thing in the eyes of the Lord. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, Ye have heard that it was said to, by them of old, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. It wasn't David's problem that he saw Bathsheba on the roof taking a bath. The problem was when he continue to dwell on that, continue to look, continue to watch. That's when the lust came. So, brothers and sisters of the church, as God's faithful people, we need to be cautious of how we dress. We don't want to be held responsible for someone else. They're going to have to be responsible if someone's lusting, but we're going to be a little responsible if we nudge it in that direction. So we need to be cautious and remember God's people is a peculiar people and we're dressing differently and looking differently than the world. Here's one that a lot of people, Jesus preaching in John, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, this is one that lots and lots of people have a problem with. It says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Wow. Heavy. Heavy duty. Was Jesus trying to uh, uh, create some problems for us here? Did, is, he, is, is he playing games with us? What does he mean? What does he mean? Let me read you some Bible commentary. It says, Jesus revealed no qualities, exercised no powers that man may not have through faith in Him. Hello? His perfect humanity is that which all His followers may possess if they will be in subjection to God as He was. If we are in subjection to our Father God as Jesus was to His Father, we can be victorious. Amen. See, one sin put Adam and Eve out of the kingdom. One darling sin is going to keep us out. A little more commentary on that. It says, The Son of God was surrendered to the Father's will and depended upon His power. So utterly was Christ emptied of self that He made no plans for Himself. He accepted God's plans for Him. And day by day the Father unfolded His plans. So should we depend upon God that our lives may be the simple outworking of His will. Amen. I just told someone yesterday, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if a 3 by 5 card would drop down to us from heaven every week? 
But that's not the way it works. It's called faith. Faith, friends. Now, we're still not quite so sure about that, but in Ministry of Healing, page 176, God has given us the power of choice. It is ours to exercise. We cannot change our hearts. We cannot control our thoughts, our impulses, our affections. We cannot make ourselves pure, fit for God's service, but we can choose to serve God. We can give Him our will. Then He, then God, what did Paul say? Christ in you, the hope of glory. He will then work in us to will and to do according to His good pleasure. So who's doing the work? The Lord is doing the work. Through the Holy Spirit, the things I used to hate I learned to love, and the things I used to love I learned to hate. That's a God thing, isn't it? It is a God thing. Thus our whole nature will be brought under the control of Christ. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That's what he's asking us to do. Back to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, 20. Lay not up yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moss nor rust doth corrupt, and thieves do not break through nor steal. Where do we lay our treasures? Many are building bigger mansions, bigger this, bigger that. All I can say is more fuel for the fire here soon. Lay ourselves, and plus the fact is, folks, you can't outgive God anyway. You just can't do it. Jesus told the story in Matthew chapter 19 of the rich man. The rich man came to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, keep the commandments. Amen. Was he telling him to do something that was impossible? Amen. In himself it was impossible, but Christ working in him it wasn't impossible. And he had a lot of wealth, and the Bible says that the rich man walked away from God because he had much. Gave up his eternal salvation for some trinkets on this old planet. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 24, Jesus preaching, it says, No man can serve two masters, for either ye will hate the one and love the other, or you else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Didn't say you might be able to if you try hard enough. It says you can't. You got to choose one. You either choose this world and the pleasures of this world, or you choose the one that God has prepared for us. What does it say in Hebrews 11 about Moses? He chose to forfeit all those luxuries of Egypt. To be with God's people and suffer. Where is Moses today? Amen. Where is he? He came down on the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah. Elijah representing those who will never see death and, res and go to heaven, and the other Moses, those who died and was resurrected. Amen. The dead in Christ rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air to be with the Lord. There shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. Praise God. Amen. Matthew chapter 7. Last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 13 and 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there go in thereat. That straight is S-T-R-A-I-T, not G-H-T. It means strict. Strict. You remember the prodigal son? He thought his liberties were restricted. And so he went out in the world and just lived it up and drank it up and parted it up. And all of a sudden he realized one day, hmm, my father's servants are eating be better than I am. 
What was he? We were speaking of pigs in the children's story. What was he eating? The husk and things that was to be given to the pigs. He was eating that. And says he finally came to himself. Folks, we need to come to ourselves and realize that Jesus' way is the only way. Amen. There is no, you can't crawl through, you can't climb through, you can't climb over or under. Jesus is the only way. And I'm sharing with you the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' words. Not mine. Lead it to discretion. Many there go in there at, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Why is it only going to be few? Comparative. Is it because there's not enough grace? There's enough grace to save every one of the eight billion people on planet Earth and, and have surplus. Amen. It's because of the choices we make. The choices we make. We can either surrender, surrender the will or keep the will to ourselves, but it's not going to end very pleasantly. Matthew 7, again, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name? cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then shall I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Is it possible we have our membership in the church books and still be lost? That's what it's saying. Examine ourselves, we're told. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, there's a few words there that's in red. My grace is sufficient for thee. Grace is not only undeserved merit, friends. Grace is power to be obedient. Amen. Romans 1, 5. Grace makes it possible Remember, the Pharisees brought a woman that was caught in adultery and threw her down at Jesus' feet and made a big to-do and said that she should have been stoned to death. And he stooped down and he started to write in the sand. And he was writing the sins of the Pharisees. And one by one, they started leaving. Jesus finally looked up and said to the woman, where are thy accusers? Sir, there are none. He said, neither do I accuse thee. Isn't that grace? Go and sin no more. I will give you the grace. I've forgiven you. Then you can be in my mansions that I'm preparing for you. In John chapter 3, Verse 5, Jesus said, Unless you are born of the water and of the Spirit, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Does God mean what He says? Amen. Does He say what He means? Amen. These are the words of Jesus. And so it's not always peace I give unto you. Praise God that He does. But I'm going to tell you what, if you're trying to serve the devil and the Lord at the same time, you won't have the peace. Matter of fact, one of the worst positions you can possibly be in is have one foot in the church and one foot in the world. That is one miserable position to be in. But God's grace is sufficient. A little commentary, we cannot wait until judgment before we consent to deny self and to lift up the cross. We cannot then form characters for heaven. It is here in this life that we must take sides with the humble, self-denying Redeemer. It is here that we must overcome envy, strife, selfishness, and love of money and the love of the world. 
It is here that we must enter the school of Christ and learn of the Master the precious lessons of meekness and lowliness of mind. And here it must be our aim and earnest effort to be loyal and true to the God of heaven by obeying his commandments. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. He's not telling us to do something that's an impossibility. He's telling us that he can do it with his power. Again, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I was out of the church for 30 some years. My mother was a fine Seventh-day Adventist lady, a real mother in Israel. But I decided that I was going to do it my way. Frank Sinatra had that song, I, I did it my way. Don't work out so well. Amen. But because of the Lord's mercy and tender care and the wooing of His Holy Spirit, I finally got to see a little glimpse of the Jesus that I now serve. And the things of earth grow strangely dim. Amen. At the time this was happening in the very early years of the 1980s, a song was, that came out, and it was supposed to be a song dedicated to a spouse. But I've taken those words, and I dedicated this to my Jesus. Okay? And it goes something like this. You're my bread when I'm hungry. You're my sheltered from troubled winds. You're my anchor in life's ocean. But most of all, you're my best friend. When I need hope and inspiration, you're always strong when I'm tired and weak. I could search this whole world over, and you'd still be everything that I need. You're my bread when I'm hungry. You're my shelter from troubled winds. You're my anchor in life's ocean. But most of all, dear Jesus, you're my Amen. best friend. Amen. Let him be your best friend. Do not allow the enemy to distract you in any way, shape, or form, because I'm here to share with you as God is on his throne in heaven. Probation is soon to close. Amen. Jesus is coming. We've talked about it for years, and those older in the church have heard it all their lives. But you know, it never rained a drop during Noah's time until it rained. And I saw, I might have shared this with you before, but there was a depiction that was drawn by an artist of Noah's Ark. And he was headed to the Ark, and he had bags of gold in his hands. And it just said, too late. Too late. There's a song in our hymnal. We're going to ch change our songs for the closing song, Tim. Page 499. As we sing this, let's think about how much Jesus means to us. And that he is, by God's grace, our best friend. Let us stand as we sing our closing song, number 499, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What does it say in the second stanza? Is there trouble anywhere? The question today is, is there anywhere without trouble in the world we live in today? Coming again, coming again. Amen. Jesus is coming again. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we praise you. We thank you for your goodness. We know in the message to Laodicea that all that you love, you chasten and rebuke. In other words, we need to listen to the warnings that you've given to us. Throughout the ages, you've given warning. You gave warning to Adam and Eve. Don't eat of that. We know the results. 
just a little taste of it. But that's more than enough. We want to go home. We're sick of this sin-filled world. We want to be in a place where there'll be no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more sadness. We want to be in a place where the animals will not be vicious, where the little children can lead them. We want to be in a place where the air is clear, it's not filled with smoke coming out of Canada. We want to be in a place where there be nothing but joy and peace and happiness throughout the ceaseless ages. And as one old preacher said, God votes for you, Satan votes against you, and you are the deciding vote. The question is, what will it be? Even so, come Lord Jesus, we pray. Dismiss us now with thy blessings. And may we be blessed the rest of this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen.